We are going to be in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 8 through 13 tonight. And uh, we are continuing the discussion tonight on the qualifications of leadership within the church, male leadership within the church, dealing with deacons. Now, this word deacon, you, you see it in your Bible. Um, some churches use it a lot. Some churches don't. The, the Greek word for deacon, when you see that word in your Bible, is diakonos or diakonos. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right, but that's what I'm going to go with. Um, that word in the New Testament means servant. That's what deacon means, um, or attendant. The actual definition of the Greek word means one who ministers or cares for others. Now, in your Bible, the word diakonos is most often translated servant. And so when you see someone being referred to as a servant or being called a servant, oftentimes it is this word that is also translated in other places, deacon. Now, um, as I said, it's most often translated servant, except in a few places scripturally where it actually refers to what we call the office of deacon or the appointed position uh, within the church. Um, here, the word diakonos is translated deacon. Um, it's also translated that way in Philippians chapter 1, verse 1. And then um, it's possibly referring to the same thing in Romans chapter 16, verse 1, where diakonos is actually translated servant, referring to Phoebe, and we'll talk about that later. But, but the concept of, of what a deacon is, or what this word servant means, is it primarily refers to what people would call menial service, okay? Menial service is not a derogatory term. It's not meant to demean or, or somehow subdue the concept of this, but when it refers to menial service, it means the stuff like the way of tables, which the uh, early deacons did in the church, or what you would see as sweeping the floors or stacking the chairs or those types of things that need to get done within the fellowship is, is often what type of service the concept of deacon is referring to. Now, Jesus used the word to convey one of his most radical ideals of, of human relationships. And that was the ideal that mutual human relationships are about mutual service involving self-sacrifice. He used the word deacon to, to establish this concept. In Mark chapter 10, verses 43 through 45, we see this theme discussed, and really Jesus says that it was the, the purpose of his entire life. He says, On the contrary, whoever wants to become great among you will be your servant, or deacon. And whoever wants to be first among you will be a slave to all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, or deaconed, but to serve, or deacon, and to give his life as a ransom for many. And so Jesus himself said his primary purpose in coming to this earth was to serve us, or to deacon us. Later on in the upper room, uh, when he was uh, establishing the foot washing concept in Luke chapter 22, verse 27, he says this, For who is greater, the one at the table, or the one serving, or deaconing? He says, isn't the one at the table referring to himself? He goes, but I am among you as one who serves. Now, that was established there because the concept of foot washing was the most menial of all the tasks, right? Like if there was a group of servants and one of those servants got the job of foot washing, all the other servants would go, dang, you got the bad job. Like, it was the lowest of the low, and yet Jesus Christ himself said, look, I came here to serve you guys in every possible way, and he actually washed their feet. And so um, it's natural, therefore, that this word diakonos in the Greek, or this word deacon, came to represent all manner of service in the Gospels. All manner of concepts of serving people, serving one another, is wrapped up in this idea of being a deacon. Now, in the Greek New Testament, According to 2 Corinthians 11.23 and Romans 11.13, an apostle and the apostles were designated deacons of Christ. Paul himself in Colossians chapter 1 verse 27 or verse 25 calls himself, this is Paul the apostle, he calls himself a deacon of the church or a minister of the church. And then in 1 Timothy chapter 4 verse 6, Timothy himself, who this letter is written to, is described as a good servant of Jesus Christ or a good deacon of Jesus Christ. And so this idea of being a deacon, all right, in its concept of, of service, everything down to, the, to the, what would be considered the menial tasks, there is nothing self-conscious in the concept of, of deaconing or being a deacon. There is nothing self-promoting in the word deacon, um, 
And really, all of us as Christians, every servant of the Lord, are called to be humble servants, right? That's what the Bible calls us to be. And that's really the concept that's wrapped up in deaconing. Now, it's very ironic then that, that the very act that Jesus used to illustrate the call to deacon-like, humble service, the very, the very thing he used, foot washing, to illustrate to his disciples, as leaders in the church, guys, this is the type of service you're to do for people. It's very ironic that the humblest of service was then made into a big ceremonial act by the church over the years. In Canon 3 of the 17th Synod of Toledo, now if you're like me and you're like, what does that even mean, Right? It's basically one of the gatherings of the church leaders that happened over the years as they would get together to kind of define doctrine. It happened in A.D. 694. But in Canon 3 of the 17th Synod, the 17th meeting of church leaders, foot washing was made mandatory through the churches of Spain. It was established as this is one of the holy acts that you must do in your churches. It eventually became a public performance by the leaders of church and state. In 1213, King John in England um, made a big public ceremonial event of foot washing, and he brought in all these poor people, and he's like, I'm going to wash their feet, and everybody watch me, watch, watch how humble I am, watch what I am doing, I am washing all these people's feet, and then what he actually did is he gave all of the poor people that came through to wash their feet 13 pence, 13 pennies, right? Um, and this act became known as the Royal Mondi, which is still observed today in England by the Church of England. In 1530, Cardinal Wolsky um, was recorded, and he made sure it was recorded, that he washed and wiped and kissed the feet of 59 poor men publicly. What a, what a humble act, and make sure everybody knows about it, right? And then in 1685, on what became known as Maundy Thursday, King James II um, gathered 52 poor men and with wonderful humility washed their feet and kissed their feet. Um, the Royal Mondi, as I said, continues today in England. It's recorded on a certain Thursday of, of every year. Um, it doesn't have the foot washing anymore, and it doesn't have as much of the hypocrisy that it used to have. But basically what they do every year is they bring uh, the elderly poor who, who have been recognized as giving service to others, and they bring them together in a big ceremony, and the, and the Queen of England and the leaders, they honor them, and they give them financial gifts. As a part of the ceremony, ironically enough, the officials still wear towels around their waist as a part of this royal Mondi service. And the queen and the, her attendants, they all carry bouquets of fragrant herbs, um, which is ironic too because the fragrant herbs were originally carried in the royal Mondi because the stench of plague was everywhere. <laughs> and so they carried these flowers to, to get rid of the stench of plague. But they still observe it today. And um, it's just ironic, right? That's something that Jesus said, I want, I want to demonstrate to you the most lowliest Humble of ser humble, humblest of service became this big pomp and ceremony. Either way, history shows how prone the church is to missing the point of deaconing, missing the point of what it means. Um, foot washing wasn't only made a parody in the church over the years, but the office of deacon in, in many churches even today has been turned into a seat of power, uh, sometimes abuse. In some denominations, in some church cultures, uh, people even see the office of deacon as some type of place of political power, and they want their name badge that says deacon so-and-so on it. And, 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 you know, how far from the spirit of Christ, right? How far from, from the heart of Christ is that when, when people have turned the concept of being the humblest of servants into something to be paraded and, and parodied, and it's just really ridiculous. But we got to remember the point of 1 Timothy, the point of this letter, that the good conduct of the church, the proper workings of the church, everything from our governance to how we do church, it all has to do with the mission of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It all has to do with the gospel going forth into the world and people not having any reason to reject the gospel based upon the hypocrisy of the church. And so this following list of credentials we're looking at today, which is, which is the continued thought, is last week we looked at the qualifications of elders, overseers, bishops, or what we call today pastors. We are now moving into this list of credentials for those who would be called deacons within the church. And it has everything to do with the gospel. So let's pray before we get into it. Father, we thank you, God, for your word, and we thank you, Lord, again for the practicality, Lord, that you describe to us in detail what the men of God should look like that you're calling into your service, Lord. God, your word is so, 
so full of, of examples and teachings, God, on what your people should be, how they should be, what they should follow, Lord, as we serve you, God. And Lord, here in this letter in 1 Timothy, God, as we've been studying, Lord, it is so critical that we do church right, that our leaders lead right, that they are the right type of people, that we are the right type of people collectively as your church, God, because it affects the gospel going forth. And so, Lord, as, as we studied last week, again tonight, Lord, may we learn these things. Lord, even if we're not called to, to be leaders and elders and pastors or deacons in the church, Lord, but may we understand what these leaders should look like, God, so that, one, we could pray for our leadership in our churches, to lift them up, Lord, to even hold them accountable, God, to you, Lord, because they are accountable to you. And, Lord, more importantly, God, that as we come together, as we might visit other churches or, or, or days where you call us to move and we're looking for a church, Lord, that we would know what good godly leadership is supposed to look like and so lord we thank you for it encourage us god we love you so much in jesus name amen all right first timothy chapter 3 verse 8 deacons likewise should be worthy of respect not hypocritical not drinking a lot of wine and not greedy for money holding the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience now deacons unlike elders or pastors do not hold a teaching office all right they are not in the place of teaching or doing exegetical expository teaching of the doctrinal foundations of our faith to the body they don't hold that position they don't have that responsibility but they are expected to have the same respectability as the pastors and the elders they are expected to have the same elder-like reputation now, it says that they should be worthy of respect. And it's interesting, as Paul gets into this, he defines what that means by telling us what it's not. All right? You know, that, that there should be dignified or, or venerated in character. That would it, that's what it means to be respected. But then he goes on to say, not these things. So it's very easy to say the opposite of the things he says to not be are the qualifications of being a deacon or being recognized into this, this office of service within the church. So the first thing he says is not hypocritical. You guys know what hypocritical is, right? That's one of the most favorite words for the unsaved world to throw at the church. Hypocrites. Hypocrites. What does that word mean? Well, what hypocritical means is saying one thing to one person and something different to a different person with the intent to deceive them. That's what hypocrisy is. It's to be a liar. It's to be double-tongued. In other translations, it says to be, um, not be double-tongued or not to be two-faced. All right? We all understand what those terms mean. It's, it's that person who's one way to one person and different to someone else. Or they talk one way to these people, but then they talk completely different to these people. It's being two-faced, wishy-washy, double-tongued. In other translations, it says they should be worthy of respect and they should be sincere. All right? Um, what it's describing here is, is, a, is a man who could be trusted. A man who was respectable because he was credible. And he was credible because he was trustworthy. That's what it's talking about. This is one of the beginning qualifications of a deacon. One who's recognized as a servant within the church. Then he says, not drinking a lot of wine. We talked a little bit about that, uh, that last week. In the New King James Version, it says, not given to wine. The idea is, is that you're not addicted to. You are not controlled by. You are not a heavy drinker. You're not a person who, who, who has no constraint or control when it comes to being able to have an alcoholic beverage. And really the concept is a man who is drunk on wine doesn't, der doesn't deserve any respect at all anyways. And then it says, not greedy for money. That word greedy there, it's the idea of being driven by money. It's the idea of a man whose decisions to serve are based upon money. Or that person is controlled by money. This is the type of person when you say, hey, hey bro, we have a big need in the church, you know, well what is it? Well, it, it's, not, it's not teaching or it's not any, anything that you might call prestigious and that, you know, we actually need somebody to dig a ditch over there. <laughs> well, am I going to get paid for it? disqualified that is not the deacon that is being talked about here to be a deacon means embracing a position of character from top to bottom trusted credible truthful 
and in control of their self. Very much like the elders and the leaders. Verse 9, he said, holding the mystery of faith with a clear conscience. See, as I said earlier, unlike elders, deacons are not required to be able to teach. That's what it said in the description and qualification of pastors, the elders, the overseers, that they were able to teach, that they were able to, to dig in and to dig out the doctrines and, 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 the, and the foundational teachings of the word of God and, 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 and transmit those things to the body. Deacons don't have that requirement. They, they don't have to be able to teach to be a deacon within the church. But yes, it says they have to hold firmly to the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience. What does that mean? Well, that word mystery or mystery of the faith, that concept, it's a term that is commonly used by Paul. And when you see him talking about the mystery of the faith or the mystery of Christ, what he's referring to is he's using this term to describe something that was once hidden but is now revealed to those with a spiritual discernment. Specifically, here in the context of this book, he was referring to the good news of the gospel. Someone who holds the good news of the gospel with a clear conscience. As I said, sometimes this, this mystery is referred to the mystery of Christ or the mystery of gospel, it says in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 19. But really, what he's referring to is the mystery in Old Testament times was this. Here's the mystery. How can God forgive sins? That was the mystery. How is God going to save the whole world? How is he going to do that? Well, the mystery was solved when they found out that God could indeed forgive sins by pouring out his wrath for our sins on his son on the cross. That's when the mystery was made clear. The mystery of our faith was made clear by Jesus Christ. It was made clear of what he did, and that's why Paul also calls it the mystery of Christ. How is God going to save people? By killing his own son. By, by having him die for our sins on the cross. Deacons, those who are recognized and lifted up into a position of recognized servant authority within the church, must understand that truth and hold on to that truth. That if, if a person believes that Christ died on the cross for their sins, any person, it doesn't matter their background, their race, their ethnicity, their, their, it, nothing, none of that matters. But if one believes that Christ died on the cross for their sins, and that person trusts in his atoning work alone, that they will be saved. That's what it's saying. A person who is recognized into this position of, of service within the church as a deacon must hold firmly to that truth. They must hold it. But, but what does he mean by hold firmly with a clear conscience? It means that he must not just logically assent to it. It doesn't mean that he just... just factually understands the concept, but that he believes it so much that it directs his life. That he believes in the truth of the gospel so much that it directs the decisions he makes, it directs the attitude he has, it directs his behavior, it directs everything about him. And you might think, well, isn't that what all Christians are called to do? Yeah. But do they? No. And that's why when it comes to the church, when it comes to those that would be in a position of leadership and service, his conscience doesn't condemn the way he lives. When a person has a good conscience, it means that, that they're clear. They, they're, they're like, before the Lord and before all that, I'm good. I know I'm living the way God wants me to. I know I'm obeying him. I know I'm doing, I, I, I know I'm doing what he wants me to do. That's the person that you say, great, you know what? You have the, the character where we could, we could recognize you and lift you up into a recognized place of service within the church. Good conscience is a, is a big issue in 1 Timothy. In 1 uh, Timothy chapter 1, verse 5, Timothy is commanded by Paul to, to basically tell the false che teachers in Ephesus, stop spreading your lies, stop spreading your errors, right? He goes, I'm commanding you to go tell them to knock it off. They're, they're, they're misleading people. And then Paul says the goal in correcting them, verse 5 is now the goal of our instruction is love that comes from a pure heart, a good conscience, and a sincere faith. That's the goal of correcting them, that they get back to true, pure love that comes from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith, that they're doing and preaching what is true and right and what God is calling us to preach. And then in verse 19 of chapter 1, he tells Timothy the way to fight the good fight, the way to stand strong as you go to correct these people and, and to tell them what they're teaching is wrong and to correct it, he says, with faith and what? A good conscience. 
It is easy to follow God and to do what he's calling us to do and obey him when we have a clear conscience. Right? How many of you have ever found yourself in sin and the first thing you want to do is stop going to church? Or you've sinned and now you don't want to read the Bible anymore. Right? Oh, I've sinned. I can't pray. Right? Because your, your conscience is no longer good. It's muddied up and now you can't even go to God to talk to him. Much less be in a place of saying, hey, I'm going to humbly serve the body and not have my conscience be corrupted by the things that could come out of that. We'll talk about that in a little bit. But when a deacon holds firmly to the mystery of the faith, which is the cross-centered gospel with a clear, clear conscience, he, he's in great shape. His belief has penetrated his soul, and it is directing his life. And that's why it's so important. Because when your conscience is she- seared by sin, and it isn't clear, you can't serve right. Because you're not going to serve with the right attitude. You're not going to serve in the right spirit. When you're serving God in the place of saying, I get the gospel so fully and so, so clearly, I understand that, that the only reason I'm able to do this and the only reason I'm alive is because God loved me so much, he died for my sins on the cross, that I am nothing special, that if God could save me, he could save anybody because I was the worst of sinners. When you have that type of attitude of thank you, God, for just letting me serve you, when people are jerks and hurt your feeling, you're going to be able to like, well, I don't deserve this anyway. When things don't go right, you're going to be like, well, God, praise God that I just get to serve you. When your plans don't, you don't right, when things go bad, you're not going to be like, well, forget this stupid place. Those people are dumb. I'm better than this, right? Th- that's what he's talking about here. This is the whole idea that he's tying together. Jonathan Edwards said, conscience is like a sundial, and God's word is the sun. Only the light of the sun will give a correct reading on a sundial. Moonlight will not work. Candlelight is a joke, and both will mislead you. And his idea is he was saying that the sunlight of Scripture, as, as you're a person who understands the word of God and the gospel and what God wants us to do and who wants us to be, when you know that, it's going to shine a light. When you live by the truth of God's word, it's going to give you a clear conscience. It's going to bring you into that place of having a clear conscience, and you will be in perfect shape to be called of God to serve his people in his church. But before one is even considered... For the office of deacon within the church. Before one is even evaluated for this, verse 10, it says, they must also be tested first. If they prove blameless, then they could serve as deacons. So it's like a 15-page written test with three essays at the end. No, it's not that kind of test. What kind of testing is he talking about? Well, in chapter 5, verses 22 and 24, we already see that there was testing alluded to for the elders. 1 Timothy 5.22 says, Don't be too quick to appoint anyone as an elder. And then verse 24, he says, Some people's sins are obvious, preceding them to judgment, but the sins of others surface later. That gives us an idea of the type of testing they're talking about here. It's not referring to some official test or some probationary period like a job, right? You know, 30 days or 90 days we reevaluate you. The testing he is talking about here. That word tested means to be recognized as genuine after examination or to be deemed worthy. So what testing are they talking about here? What what have we just been talking about? Their reputation. That's what he's talking about being tested here. Are they respectable? Are they dependable? Are they trustworthy? Are they self-controlled in their liberties? Do they handle responsibility first and then play later? Do they not only know the gospel, but do they live it as the driving passion of their lives with a clear conscience? That's what it's asking. That's the testing. But they must be tested first before they are appointed as deacons. And why is this testing important? Well, number one, it's important is because the men that are raised up in the church to serve as deacons are often the same men that will eventually raise up to be pastors and elders and overseers of the flock. And so way back at the beginning, you want to make sure the person has good character, that they're mature and obedient to the Lord in their walk. And so early in the process of, of raising up leaders within the church, the church is instructed to be very, very careful. I believe the other reasons, too, is that because the pressures that come 
As men are called and step into service and service to the body within the church, the pressures that come are incredible. And when those pressures come, their inner lives will become evident very quickly. You find out real quickly who people are when you put them under pressure. It's like a saturated sponge, right? You squeeze it to find out what's inside. And sometimes you put people under pressure and they flip out. You go, well, you're, you're not ready yet, you know. If you can't handle people talking about you, do not step into ministry. If you can't handle people disagreeing with you, do not step into ministry. It, it just go down the line. If you can't handle people not liking you, don't step into ministry. If you're a people pleaser and not a God pleaser, don't step into ministry. You're not ready or you're not the right person. So verse 11 He says, wives too must be worthy of respect, not slanderers, self-controlled, faithful in everything. Now, this verse is a source of a lot of discussion. And the reason is this. The Greek word that is translated wives in that verse can also be translated women. Just women in general. Now, it says wives too in the translation I'm reading from. That word, too, means likewise. So in the Greek, he's going, okay, deacons, you got to have be respectable. you got to have all these, these uh, qualifications and reputation. And then in the Greek, it goes, likewise, the women must be worthy of respect. Now, if you read different translations of the Bible, some of them translate it, and you'll read wives. Some of them will translate it, and you'll read women. And people disagree on, on what he's talking about here. Um, the context when you're studying the Bible, is always important. So the verse immediately preceding verse 11 and the verse immediately following verse 11, verse 10 and verse 12, are referring to qualifications for the the male deacons. That's what he's addressing. I believe that's why the word should be translated wives because he's talking about the qualifications of the male deacons. And so as he's given the qualifications of the male deacons, he says, your wives need to have this type of character as well. So I don't believe this verse is specifically saying, so, the women who would be called to a deacon service, I don't believe he's switching topics there per se. Um, I believe what it's saying is likewise, their wives must also have this type of character. It's like he's saying a male deacon must have a wife who has a respectability that matches his own. Uh, his, His wife's qualifications are part and parcel of his qualifications for the office of deacon. Obviously, in a husband and wife scenario, um, as, as, as his helpmate, she would be expected or, or at least encouraged to help him fulfill his duties as a deacon. Um, you know, and there's common sense to that thinking as far as in marriage, the two become one. And in the idea of a deacon and his wife would be both mutually respectable and have the same heart for serving others in the church. But neither do I believe this particular section is teaching that only men can be deacons. I don't believe that's what it's teaching because it doesn't say that. Now, yes, the context of this section is directed at males, right? He started with, you know, male leadership and teaching, and then he goes, okay, here's the qualification of the elders and the qualifications of deacons. I believe contextually it's directed at men. It's directed at the qualifications of those men who would be pastors and elders and then deacons. But deacon is not a teaching position. Deacon doesn't... involve that one thing that we looked at at the end of chapter two where God said, I've called men to this. Not because they're better or da 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 just because I called men to this and he appealed to the creation order. I created man first and I created woman. And so the teaching position is, is something that, that the pastors and the elders are, are to be able to do. But here it's not the same. Deacon is not a teaching position. It doesn't have the qualification of being able to teach doctrinally or, or, or skillfully teach doctrinally. So, so the deacon is not expected to do that type of teaching that only the men are called to do within the church. On top of that, if you go to Romans 16 verse 1, Paul is writing here and he says this, I commend to you our sister Phoebe, who is a servant of the church in Senshre. Senshre, you see that? Yeah, I, I hope I pronounced that right. 
our sister Phoebe. Obviously, Phoebe's a female. Who is a servant of? Guess what that word servant is? Diakonos. The same word translated deacon. Phoebe is called by Paul a deacon of the church in Senshre. And then on top of that, some extra biblical historical writings. There's a letter from Pliny to the Roman emperor Trajan in AD 112. And in this letter, he mentions, quote, two slave women who they call deaconesses. So in the early church, there was an emerging order or group or, or, or just an, a deaconesses within the church. Women who were recognized in this place of, of humble service within the church and called deacons. All right? You don't see the word deaconess in the Bible. But with Phoebe specifically being called a deacon of the church in Centre, and then you go back to, well, the, the deacons weren't expected or called to, to, to teach doctrinally, um, you see that, that I believe that women can be deacons. So while I don't believe that this section of 1 Timothy is directly teaching the qualifications of women de- deacons, and that this particular section of 1 Timothy, uh, this verse 11, I believe truly is referring to the wives of the male deacons who are called to serve. I do believe that women's can, women can serve as deacons within the church. And by association, they would have the same qualifications as the male deacons. Which then does tie back into how others translate verse 11. Women too must likewise also be respectable, not slander, self-controlled, and so on and so forth. We have deaconesses here at Hosanna. We have a whole ministry of the deaconesses, and they do all kinds of stuff. And the women that, that have stepped into that ministry uh, are, are such a blessing to the body. And so um, there, there's no prohibition here in that regard. So verse 11 and 12, wives too must be worthy of respect, not slanderers, self-controlled, faithful, and everything. And then he goes back to the men. Deacons are to be the husbands of one wife managing their children and their own households competently. So again, talking about the male deacons here, um, they have the same domestic qualifications as the elders. When it says uh, deacons are to be the husband of one wife, all right, that's that concept we talked about last week, that they must be a one-woman man. It doesn't mean that they can have only ever been married one time, Right? It's not saying that if you were been married and then you're divorced or widowed that you were disqualified from serving in this thing. It says, what it's saying is that if and when you are married, that you are completely faithful to that spouse you're married to. You're not a cheater. You're not flirting with other people. That you are completely faithful to them. That's what it means. And then she too, the deacon's wife, must be of a good reputation, respectable, venerated for her character, It gives us a little list there. It says, not a slanderer. Other translations say, not a gossiper. That word gossiper there means a false accuser or someone prone to slander. Now, that word gossip is a word that gets tossed around a lot, and I think it gets tossed around a lot incorrectly. People like to to say, if anybody has anything to say about another person in any context, you're gossiping. If that was the definition of gossip, then how are you supposed to go to your pastor and get counsel? (gasps) You're talking about someone. That's not gossip. To going to, to someone you deeply care about and saying, I have to confide in you in something. There's an issue. There's a problem. That's not gossip. What gossip is, is a casual or an unconstrained conversation or reports or stories about another person that typically involve details that are not truly confirmed as being true. That's what gossip is. I heard this about so-and-so. It's not really confirmed to be true, right? But you're sharing the story anyways. It's not just talking about someone else to someone else. Um, It's speaking these unverified details about someone else with the intent to damage their character. And that's why in other translations it's translated as not a slanderer. Slander is the word that when you go to tell somebody a lie about someone else or information that you're not 100% is true and your intent is to damage their character, that's what gossip is. Or even if you're trying to tell people these unverified facts about somebody, not to fix a problem, not to address anything, not to bring unity within the body, but to elevate your own status. That's what gossip is. 
So it says not a slanderer, not a gossiper. It says she must be self-controlled. It's the same thing as it says for the husband. Not a drunk is what it means. Not an excessive drinker. But this word also means not, not overindulging in, 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 any, in any way, right? To, to be self-controlled in that, that regard. And then faithful in everything. That just means trustworthy. So the same qualifications as her husband. She has to be a person of, of respectable character. And then it goes on to say that the deacons must manage their kids and their home well. Again, same domestic qualifications of the elder. The point here is that their home is, is in such a way that there can be no blame laid at their feet. It doesn't mean that their kids need to be perfect because then there probably would be no pastors anywhere because pastors often have difficulty in their families because the devil's like, oh, oh, you're a leader in the church? Guess what? I'm going to attack your kids, right? What it means is that the way they teach and raise their kids is in a way where there's no blame there. You can't say, well, you, you screwed them up. No, no, you, you raised them right. They just chose to be rebellious. It's that idea that blame can't be laid at their feet. And so, um, and again, the same thing with the elders. There's no reason to think that if they can't manage their, if they're home, how are they going to manage their ministry, right? If they're the type of person that, that when their kids get out of line, they just, they blow up and beat the snot out of them. Well, are they going to do that if they're vacuuming the floor and somebody walks across with dirty shoes, <laughs> blow up and beat the snot out of them? I mean, it's like, this is what it's talking about. They need to have this character across the board. And so verse 13, it says, For those who have served well as deacons acquire a good standing for themselves and great boldness in the faith that is in Jesus Christ. So there's a twofold reward for those deacons who serve well. There's a twofold reward. And there's a reward before people, and there's a reward before God. So he goes, those who have served well. That word is the, is the same concept of managing their family well. That they have served in a way where there's no blame that could be laid at their feet. They've served in a way where nobody could say, well, they did this wrong and they did this wrong. But no, they, 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 they did it right. Or they had the right intentions in what they were doing. They were trying to be obedient and honor God in what they did. So those that have served well acquire a good standing for themselves. This is referring to their reputation before people, before the congregation they serve. It means an excellent reputation that they have the respect of and they have influence within the congregation they serve because of their character, because of how they have served. Because of their, their elder-like respectability, um, their, their, their belief in the gospel that, that is affected and influenced by, the, the behavior that is influenced by that uh, is shown that they hold firmly to the faith, right? They don't waver on the gospel. That because of their elder-like respectability, you see that their, their living belief, the behavior, how they conduct themselves comes from a good conscience, that their tested life oozes with godly character. In the context of Timothy here, that the, the male deacon's wife is his best qualification, that she has a godly character as well. That he's able to manage and lead his family well. And all of this gives him great standing with the people he serves. That his reputation amongst those he serves within the church is good. And because of that, his authority goes far beyond what he says. Because, because the right that he has to have authority is shown in who he is. And then it says, great boldness in the faith that is in Christ Jesus. And this is just talking about a confidence a boldness in their own faith in Christ, that they know because of the clear conscience and all the other things that they are serving God, that they are being obedient to him. And so when God calls them to exercise authority within, within the ministries that they're a part of, they do so with confidence. And you could taste that. When someone is, is clearly a called godly leader and they exercise authority in your lives, you, you can taste that calling. There's a sense of like, yeah, you're, you're not trying to lord over me. You're not trying to beat me up. You're not trying to make a power play. You're, you're just, you're, you're obeying God in what you're saying. And so, yeah, okay, thank you for the correction or thank you for the direction. And yeah, I, 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 I want to be obedient in that because I believe in what God's doing in your life and the life of our church. And it's that whole concept all wrapped together. That really there's an ever-deepening confidence that comes in those who draw close to Jesus Christ. And so to conclude here, I said last week that the congregation will become what the leadership is. If the leadership is wishy-washy, if the leadership is unfaithful, if the leadership is unkind, if the un leadership is unfaithful, that's what the body will be. But on the flip side of that coin, when the leadership is godly, when they are obedient, 
when they are faithful and trustworthy. You will see that permeate through the congregation that they're leading. And so the character of those who would fill the office of deacon as well as elder is of utmost importance. We have to pray for such leadership in our churches. We have to seek such leadership in our churches because as the leadership is, so will the church be. And in a broad sense for all of us, the, 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 the direction that our lives are pointed in matters so much. If you're off just a little bit, it might not show up at first. It might not show up right away, but give it time and eventually the wrong example will lead many astray. And that's why if you're, if you're wanting to or you feel a call to step up into leadership within the church as a deacon or even a deaconess to be involved in ministry and leadership, do so with great humility, knowing that your example, your character, it affects so much. But don't let that scare you. Because as you realize that you are nothing without the Lord and you cling to him with everything and you're like, God, I can't do this without you, man, he does some wonderful things through people. He does miraculous things through people. He takes people whose lives were, were just trash, honestly, and, and makes them beautiful. And that's what God does. That's what God does. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, God, so much for your word. We thank you, God, again for this, for this listing, Lord, uh, uh, this description of the godly people. Lord, specifically here in 1 Timothy, it's the godly men you would call into deacons, Lord, but we do see in your scripture that you've called women into the same position of, of, of service and in, in, in having that ministerial authority over positions of service within the church. God, we understand that those that you've called up to this position of, of, of servant ministry, God, aren't the pastors and the elders, Lord, and, and we understand the difference between the two, Lord, mainly that, that, that calling of teaching that you've laid upon men. But Lord, all of it, God, we, we ask and pray, Lord, that you would bless our leadership, that you would bless the pastors and servants in our churches, God, Lord, those that serve in a way to just glorify you, God, when it comes to the menial things, or those who clean the bathrooms. Lord, some of us are like, ugh, bathrooms. Lord, they got to get cleaned, and somebody does it, Lord, and we thank you so much for them. Those that make sure lights are working, and, and, and God, all the ministries, Lord, from, from, from security and sound and children's church and all the things, Lord, that have to happen, that our church would function and behave in a way that brings glory to you and the gospel to the world, we thank you for them. And we ask, God, for, for every single one of us, Lord, that your spirit would fill us and that we would all step into the place that you're calling us to. That, God, if we have gifts and talents that you've given us, be it with, with, with technology, with just in being kind to people, in music or instrumentation, whatever it may be, God, that we would prayerfully pray and seek your infilling in our lives, God, that we would be able to step up as godly examples into those places of leadership and authority you're calling us to do. Because, God, there is a lot of work to do. But we also know, God, that you don't just call everybody into these positions because some of us simply aren't ready. Some of us have a lot of maturity to go through. And so, God, we ask for that, too, that you would just work in and through all of us, God, to keep molding us and shaping us into your image that we would be ready to respond when you call. And God, as we pray for our leaders in our churches, Lord, and we see these qualifications that you've listed here, Lord, we just pray for them in all these areas. That God, those that, that, that we get to serve under and those that, that we are yielded to in, in, in spiritual authority and leadership, God, we pray that their character would be guarded by you and that they would always be respectable, trustworthy, self-controlled individuals. Lord, that they would be people who hold to the truth of the gospel with a clear conscience, God, that they would serve without distraction. That, Lord, they would be people that understand the cost of their salvation and they would just seek eagerly to see that happen in all the lives of those that they serve. That, God, they would understand that the even the menial tasks are an opportunity to serve you with joy. And so, Lord, thank you for, for your church, God. We thank you. 
I don't quite understand, Lord, why you choose to use us as messed up as we are, but Lord, we accept it and I accept it. And thank you for doing that miracle in our lives, God, that you would take such messed up, broken people and you would make a family, a community of people who love one another and just really confounds the world around us. God, may it lead to salvation for those that don't know you. We thank you. We love you so much. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Well, God bless you guys. Let's worship.